So hello, and welcome to today's workshop, Humanizing Your Online Course. I did just now realize I didn't change the date. It is not February 27th. It is March 28th. <laughs> Forgive me for the small typo. Uh, today we're going to talk a lot about how to infuse more of your own personality um, and actually owning up to small mistakes like this is one way that you can show your, your personality and your realness to your students. They really do actually appreciate that. So consider that a learning by design moment. Acknowledge your mistakes and uh, when you can, fix them. I am your presenter for today. My name is Stephanie Richter and I'm the Assistant Director of the Faculty Development and Instructional Design Center at Northern Illinois University. I'm grateful that you're all here today and looking forward to what you can contribute to our conversation. To facilitate that, I would really like if you would start by introducing yourself to the rest of the group so that we can have a, a little bit of a community going. So if you'd like to do that via text chat, just type a little message with your name, maybe your department, or if you're not from NIU, we have a few colleagues elsewhere, let us know where you're from. And if you've taught online, if you'd like to introduce yourself quickly via microphone, you can raise your hand like Maureen did. Maureen, go ahead. Hi, uh, my name is Maureen Hogan. Um, I am currently a doctoral student at um, in the ETRA, the Educational Technology and Research um, and Assessment um, uh, Division of the College of Education. I've been teaching online courses for about seven years. My background is in, um, I, I've been a programmer, I've been training, I started, I did my first training in technology in 19, I hate to date myself, but like 1983, <laughs> um, teaching people how to do word processing. Um, I currently teach two online courses for ETRA, um, and I teach two classes at Wabonzi as well. So um, I, I always look for new ideas, and I'm really excited about this. So um, hopefully I can contribute, and hopefully I can learn from you. Sorry I took so long. Bye. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Maureen, for, for your introduction. If anyone else would like to use your microphone? go ahead and raise your hand or while no one else is speaking, go ahead and start. But I want to thank everyone else for your excellent introductions there in the, the text chat. So hopefully everyone else is reading those as well. As the text chat fills, there is a scroll bar to the right. So if you need to catch up by scrolling back up, you can do so. I know it can move a little quickly at times, but fortunately you can always go back and see what was said. So today we're going to look at uh, presence. What is uh, teaching presence or cognitive presence, social presence? We'll look at all three of those and strategies for how you can build those in your online course. We do have handouts. I put a link into the text chat. It's also there on the slide, factdev.niu.edu slash humanize handouts. You can uh, click that link and hopefully see all of the handouts we've prepared for today um, that we'll refer to periodically throughout the, uh, the session. So first off, what is presence and why is it important? So presence is about sharing perspective and and creating a community within your course. For online courses where it sometimes feels like the environment can be very sterile, creating presence and humanizing your course is establishing that, that social landscape where we can still interact um, to construct meaning rather than working individually and feeling like we're alone. At the same time, it requires first establishing the, both the instructor and all of the students as individuals, recognizing that you are people, that you're whole people, and that you're all here to learn uh, together. Then from there, you can begin to establish trust and relationships and community through interactions in your online course. The same principles honestly apply to face-to-face -face courses, but there, because everyone is in a room and face to face, it's a little bit easier to just naturally build that sense of community. Whereas online, it takes a little bit more um, preparation and practice. Although over time, once you've been accustomed to this, it will feel just as natural to you as what you do in your face to face classroom. The model that we're going to operate under today is called community of inquiry. 
this is a research-based model for establishing uh, a community with strong interactions and presence so that learners can work together as opposed to in isolation. The three components of the community of inquiry model are social presence, cognitive presence, and instructor presence. And those interact in the overlapped, I'm sorry, I moved too quickly, in those overlaps. So you can see that as an instructor, your presence and the social presence of your students combines to create a climate for your, uh, your classroom. Whereas your social presence and the cognitive presence of your students supports the, the discourse and the learning in your classroom. And cognitive presence of the students and your presence as an instructor is seen to students in how you've selected content, but really more than that is how you've designed your course and how you've constructed the experience. I've always felt selecting content is a little bit of a narrow perspective. We're going to start with instructor presence and how you select, how you set climate. And we're starting there because that's where you have the most control, so to speak. You can create a sense of yourself uh, for your students in order to show that you are, in fact, a real human being and that uh, you're approachable and personable so that, again, students feel supported and they feel like they are learning from you as opposed to learning from the computer. So our, uh, we're going to start with a series of images and I want you to look at each image. We'll pause for a few seconds on each one. Think about what that picture says about a class and what type of environment or type of experience you would have in a class with that image as inspiration. As you're doing that too, think about how you want your online class to feel or your face-to-face -face class for that matter. And therefore, um, how you are going to be, what type of uh, activities you're going to use to support that, that climate. So here we go. So with those images in mind, they're all uh, strong ways to design a course. None of them are right or wrong. Uh, I have my own impressions for what that means for what a course would be like, but I'd like it to take a moment and turn this over to you. If you would, in the upper left corner, you should see a series of icons, one of which is a pencil. If you would click the pencil, and you can choose to change the color as well if you'd like, make a mark on the picture that most represented the type of course you want to have. So we're going to use those whiteboard tools in the upper left, click the pencil icon, and then mark on a picture for the type of course you would like to see, or that you would like your course to be. Got a couple of responses, I'll wait for a few others, or if you'd like to describe the picture in the text chat, if that makes more, more sense to you. Would anyone like to share why they chose the picture they did? Feel free to in the, the text chat or via microphone. So I can start with mine. Um, I chose, 
I'll make another mark on it so it shows up. I chose this one up here, the the under the deep sea diver, because I like my course to be about exploring and finding and searching as opposed to me telling. Um, Maureen, why don't you give us a quick explanation of yours? Okay, so I chose the one right under the scuba divers because I like to see people debate and come together with ideas. So I want to see, not a clashing, but that's the closest thing, but I want to see people meet and come together and just, even if it, it just emotionally explode with knowledge, I guess that was, you know, but and the only way to do that is to not agree constantly, but to every once in a while disagree and then come to an understanding. So I want to see my students do that. That's great. That's exactly what I had in mind when I picked that as a possible image, actually, was that idea of that, like, as everyone comes together and, and um, everything just grows from there. I see a couple other comments about the exploring um, uh, with the diver. The uh, ooh, Autumn, the seal, she says, looks confident. And so she wants that to be how her students feel. That's a great point. Uh, but I like that Mary also referred to the seals and Beth about the seals being representing a community that they've all come together. Um, Others about waiting for expected or unexpected, or I like Tracy's the bridge, the pier there, is it's very clear what direction we're going. You might not have many choices, although you can see a lot. There's a great view. But we're, we're on a journey. We're going to get there. I think that creates a very strong sense of purpose for what we're looking for um, and what students are looking for in a course. I think a couple of these others, just so I can explain why I chose them as images. The uh, the crab, I think, looks very industrious, scuttles about, uh, accomplishes quite a bit, very hardworking. Um, the the big rolling wave is is that sense of being on a roll and being and moving forward. I think it's a strong sense of movement. Um, the the hat <laughs> sitting on the beach and relaxing. I like that idea of of absorbing what's coming at you, of being open to possibilities, and maybe being a little more, it looks more open-minded than closed-minded to me. It's also very comfortable, an environment where students feel relaxed um, and, and ready to take things in. Uh, the, the one with the, the white clouds and the very dark sea to me is very inspirational. This is a course that would open you to new ideas and maybe choose your, uh, open you to new ideas and inspire you to be more. Um, the sea sailboat maybe looks a little isolated, but at the same time, we are, we're moving, we're on a journey. It's a very calm sea. We're prepared and we're ready to move forward. Um, and then the, the one at the bottom with the, the, the benches might seem a little isolated, that we're not all together, but at the same time, we all have, we have a buddy we are partnered up, we're working collaboratively, and are together at the very least. We're all here at the same place at the same time and working together. Maureen, I do agree looking at the whole collage looks at how, how your course might do many of these or all of them, um, and certainly at different times. You might have beats in your course that are of different moments. Sometimes we're all moving together in the same direction. Sometimes you need to go explore on your own. And sometimes we need to focus on that collaborative um, environment where we're all, all part of a larger whole. So yes, I agree. And that's why I chose them all to be ocean themed so that we are looking at uh, thematically at the same type of concept. But great work, everyone. Thank you for going down this road of, of reflecting a little bit differently. Oh, the sea turtle, I'm sorry, Beth, yes. The sea turtle to me looks inquisitive. He's, he's up at the camera. Um, and so I chose him because it, it looks like curiosity. It looks like, um, again, someone who kind of floats with the current, but, but wants to know more. To me, that's kind of what that one meant. Great question. Uh, so thank you for being part of this reflective activity, for getting your juices flowing, and for uh, some great conversation back and forth there in the text chat. We're already building a little bit of community <laughs> amongst each other.
I've built a little bit of instructor presence by sharing some of my thoughts and philosophies on this, I hope. And we're ready to uh, move forward as our, our stronger community. So in your online course, let's get down to some uh, very specific details. How do you create presence in your own course? So I have a couple of suggestions here, and we'll look at more details on each one of them. So first, you would likely want to introduce yourself as part of your course. At the very least, on your syllabus, you'll have a statement that shows um, kind of who you are and how to contact you. I have that section here at the top where you can see all of the information on how to get in touch with me. But I also recommend including a little bit more uh, personal touch or a little more personality. So while I start with my professional background and my academic background, I'm giving my bona fides this is why I'm qualified to teach this. I also gave a little bit of details about my personal life and my family life. Uh, there's a difference, by the way, between being personal or being intimate. You don't want to share anything, um, you know, the deep, dark secrets of your personal life. Here, I talk about um, the kind of my, my life. I talk about um, my hobbies. I like to read. I do a lot of thrifting and flea marketing, uh, make jewelry. And then one of the biggest events that at the time when I wrote this was my sister had just gotten married. Now it would be my niece. My sister just had a baby. I have to show a picture. You can see it in the tiny little, just down there. Isn't she adorable? She is so cute. Um, so I would share a little bit about my, the, what's going on in my family, things that are publicly personal. Personal, not private. I also added a, a video here to the right where I kind of explain the same sorts of things. I talk about who I am, what I've done, what I, why I'm teaching this course, why I think the course is an important one for the students who are taking it, uh, so that students see me, they hear my voice very early, and can start forming that connection. I'm a real person. I'm not uh, just the person who's not just the mechanism by which they get a grade, but I'm really, really here and I'm really there. I also recommend recording a video announcement or introduction each week. Again, for an online course where you may not be having live sessions like this one, this is a, a reminder that you are there and you're a real person. <laughs> you have a face and a voice. I do these on my cell phone, actually, so they're not too fancy. Sometimes I set it up on a, um, another surface. I prop it up. I've used a selfie stick to hold it out at a distance. I've used a coworker or a family member to hold it and, and shoot the video for me. I usually do them in one or two takes. The first time I, I'll forget to say something, so I'll do it again. They're not perfect because, again, showing that um, those small mistakes or saying, um, reversing your train of thought, those are all things that make you seem more human and more real. I do make sure I don't say anything that's incorrect, such as if I've given a wrong due date for an assignment, I will re-record it in order to correct that, or at least in um, edit the video and add a small pop-up that says, oops, I was wrong, it's this date. I don't want incorrect information getting out there. I do caption these for students who uh, have disabilities or those who are watching the video someplace where they can't run audio whether they're in a public location or um, watching it with family and coworkers around so they can read those captions along with instead of um, trying to listen to the audio. But I do all of this, all of the captioning via YouTube. I upload the video. Uh, because these are short, say three or four minutes, I can caption it pretty quickly. It's not a, a huge burden and send those off to students each week. I kind of outline what the topics are going to be, what any key assignments are, um, and offer that little bit of, of editorial on what I think about what we're going to learn, the things that might not have made it into the assigned readings or into the formal um, lecture for the week, but is something that, again, creates a connection for students. I also recommend 
looking at how you're providing feedback because often the most interaction that students have from you directly is in how you grade their assignments. So if you have students doing more open-ended assignments, think about your feedback, what you're saying, how you're saying it, and make sure that you're providing enough feedback that it's meaningful and supportive. You don't have to write extensively. You don't have to mark up their whole document, but be sure that you're doing more than just assigning a grade. Make sure you are connecting and conversing with students that way. So for example, you may want to use the annotation tools in Blackboard if you've submitted a written work to an assignment. You can use these annotation tools within the, the grading, um, inline grading editor to add comments in the margin, just like you might in Microsoft Word. You can also provide more general feedback, comments on the overall paper as opposed to point in time um, uh, references. So instead of showing here on page two, I said this, I might say overall, here's what I think. And then you also can engage with students on the um, discussion board by not just not replying to every student necessarily, but applying replying to them occasionally so that they can see that you are real and you're there. You may want to reply to every single one. Uh, for uh, this is a, an example from a course that is a fake student photo. Don't I'm not disclosing other than the the content of what she wrote. I'm not trying not to disclose anything about a student directly. Um, but so the student had introduced themselves on the discussion board and said that they really like to read. Since I love to read, I replied back and created that, that sense of, again, personality and, and dialogue. If you're looking for some specific guidance on how you should engage on the discussion board, particularly on something that is more uh, content driven rather than, um, that one was an introduction, it was very personality driven. In the handouts, there's a document for uh, called Discussion Roles and Prompts. That document has more detail on these, on the different types of roles you might take on the discussion board, and the types of uh, some examples actually of what that might look like. So, what I've put here as a table is very, very much truncated compared to what you'll see on that discussion roles and prompts handout. So you'll be able to, for example, do you want to do more prompting to ask students to provide clarification and get more discussion going? Or do you want your role to be more uh, that of weaving, showing how contributions from different students maybe were connected or were related or uh, contrasting? Your role can be a little more of that, um, that, that weaving and pulling the threads together. At the same time, maybe what you want to do is work on the implications and helping students to stretch their thinking a little bit further. That if, if they've thought through this far in the line of reasoning, help them draw out further implications farther down the road. So if, we, if that was the course of action that you just suggested, how would that impact these other things? Um, so in looking at the types of thinking you want students to do, and what the role of the discussion board is for you, you might um, take a different role at different times and ask different types of questions or have different types of interactions. So I highly recommend that um, discussion roles and prompts handout that you'll find at factdev.niu.edu slash humanize handouts. Now is also a good time to mention there is a, a Word document called Strategies for Humanizing Your Online Course. If you download that document, it looks just like this. And feel free to have that open and maybe take some notes as you go um, to write down a few strategies you might take, what your role is in that strategy, the types of tools that you might use, or the communication methods you might use as well. So, uh, feel free as we start talking about social presence to start taking some notes on instructor presence. So social presence now 
is more about your students interacting with one another and building a culture and a climate and a community among your students. Social presence has to first, as I said, establish that each student is an individual and is a real person, not just a name, not a bot who's posting things the same time you're posting things. You need to help students see each other as individuals and as real people. Once you've done that, you can start building relationships, or they can rather start building relationships with one another. And through that, build some trust so that they're in a, an environment where they know that they can try and maybe fail. That's a big, um, it's a, a necessary step in learning sometimes is to, to try, put something out there, and then refine that further. Find that what you didn't do first, what you did first didn't work. And in order to be willing to do that, you really have to have trust that the others around you are going to support you through that. And ultimately, the social presence will create a sense of community where your students can work with one another to construct knowledge and understanding as they're learning instead of learning in isolation. So a few strategies we'll go through for uh, so, uh, social presence is um, having students introduce themselves, working with their social profile, having thought provoking um, discussions, and maybe incorporating collaborative learning. So for student introductions, um, I imagine many of you do that. Let's, in fact, let's do a quick poll. I'll throw that up here. Yes or no. How many of you have students introduce themselves in your own courses? Look at that response rate. I'm so impressed. So many of you responded. Uh, so most of you have said yes. That's great. Uh, introductions don't have to be a, um, a big deal necessarily. It's something you might do as part of a, a week one or maybe even a week zero before the class um, officially starts. Here, I've asked students to do something beyond just you know, tell me your name and why you're taking the course. Something a little more creative. Tell me about um, something that an object that symbolizes something about you. Um, or I taught an online course where the students were in a cohort. They all knew each other. It was their last semester. But I didn't know any of them. So for their introduction, I asked them to share something that the others don't know about them yet. I got some really interesting responses. Everything from um, one of the, the cohort members hadn't told the others yet that he had had a baby. <laughs> so that was a big deal. It was just a few weeks earlier that he and his wife had, had had their child. So he was able to break that news to them in my course, which is a really special moment. Um, others were not quite so special. There was a, a long story about someone who got drunk at a Sox game which was a funny story, um, but was only possible because she already had a great deal of trust with her other uh, classmates, which made her willing to share that. But so if you think about your, your introductions and connect them in some way to what, um, what the course is about or something that's maybe a little unique or creative, it doesn't have to be just a straight introduce yourselves. Tell me about yourself. I also highly recommend the social profiles in Blackboard. So if you are with Blackboard, we have a, um, a system here where you can add a photograph and add a little bit about yourself. This is on the discussion board. If you, once someone's done that, their photo appears with their posts in the discussion board. It's a great way to humanize your course and help students realize they're talking to other people. Um, and if you roll over that image, then you get this pop-up that shows some of the other things that that person has shared about themselves. Social profiles are available via the um, global navigation menu in Blackboard. That would be the icon up at the top, uh, or the, the menu up here at the top under your name. If you click your name, this menu will drop down, and then you can click on what will initially be a silhouette in order to, to go to your social profile page to set it up. Students can do this individually. You can set up yours as an instructor. 
again, so the students can see your photo when you're engaging with them on the discussion board, and they'll then be able to see each other's once they've set that up. You can also see student photos while you're grading if you've turned that on for, um, say, the discussion board. Um, you can also see students' photos on the, the class roster so that you can identify faces and names a little bit more and you know that your students are real people. I do, by the way, require that my students create their profile. I don't require that they use a photo of themselves. If they have a, a photo of something you know, representative that they would rather use, I'm fine with that. Um, that makes it pretty similar to having a Facebook photo, for example, where it might be you, it might be your daughter, your dog, uh, your car, just something that in some way means something to you so that we have a visual representation to connect to you as a person. On the discussion board, students have the tendency to become bored with discussions and to engage very shallowly um, because they answer so they respond to so many of them when they're taking an online course. So it's important to ask questions that are meaningful. Um, and I think sometimes we we tend to ask questions that have right or wrong answers, and then all of the students answer the same way, and everyone is just bored. Instead, if you look at the types of questions, the type of knowledge and type of thinking you want students to have, you can then ask questions that connect directly to those levels of knowledge. So this is also a handout. This is the um, STEMS for discussion questions handout. You'll find that in the handouts repository online. So you can remember these when you go back to evaluate your own discussion board questions. And then you may also want to introduce a model for critical thinking for students to engage with one another on the discussion board. So this is the Paul Elder model. Uh, this is also in your handouts, the Paul Elder model of critical thinking. Here, the recommendation would be to share this with students uh, to guide their own responses to one another. So when they're answering a student on the discussion board, instead of just saying, oh, that's a great idea, I really like your post, um, you can give them examples of what questions they might ask themselves in order to construct a more critical response. So they may ask students directly, you know, I may ask, one student may ask another to elaborate or illustrate, or the student may be looking at their, at one another's posts and asking, you know, can I find out if what someone said is true and go do that validation as their response of, oh, you claimed this and that was, I was curious about it, so I looked it up and here's what I found. This is also a great um, model for students to use to evaluate their own posts. Before they click submit, have them think about some of these questions and whether or not they have really constructed a good post for the discussion board. Um, you wouldn't want necessarily for students to think about all of these, but there are probably some that do fit the types of questions you ask. And ask students to, as a checklist, before you submit your post, think about have you really elaborated enough? Or should you give another example? Do you, uh, did you answer in a way that related to the problem? Or, um, you know, is, have you selected enough evidence in order to support your claims? So this, some of these can be used as a checklist for students to uh, evaluate their own posts to discussion boards in order to make them more fruitful for building community and building a, a more, a richer discussion, as well as these could be great prompts for students to use when they're responding to one another in order to create stronger responses to their classmates. And then you may also want to consider incorporating some collaborative learning. Collaborative learning is important for a variety of reasons. And here I want to point out in uh, a one model of collaborative learning from Barb Millis, the, one of the premises is that learning is inherently social. And so collaborative learning helps to tie into that social aspect of learning. 
in an online course without collaboration, you may be losing that piece and therefore uh, students may end up um, learning less or just being less satisfied. Collaborative learning is also one of the high impact practices that's shown to improve the learning experience for all students. High impact practices are more likely to retain students as well from one semester to another. The, for uh, making it a high impact practice, what's important about collaborative learning is working together to solve problems. So it's not just uh, working together to do something, you know, to, to submit an assignment, but really having some sort of an open ended problem to solve or question to answer. Um, and doing so together and really listening to one another and learning from one another instead of um, breaking a task down into parts that we can do on our own. With collaborative learning, it's important to focus on the process over the outcome because it's these, these process pieces of working together, talking to one another, listening to one another that make it successful. For collaborative learning, whether it's really online or offline, but particularly online, it, it can be problematic, it can be difficult and challenging, but it can be very successful. So some tips for success. One is to call them teams, not groups. Groups are random bits that you've put together, whereas a team has a sense of purpose and a team by nature has to be collaborative. Um, Anytime I work with collaborative learning, I recommend starting with some sort of a team contract. We have samples if you'd like us to, if you'd like one, just ask and we can send it to you. But the point of the contract is to establish goals for the, the team, identify specific roles, pool contact information so that everyone knows how to get in touch, and then set expectations for who's, for a workload, for meeting deadlines, and more importantly, for how you're going to meet as a group whether you're going to come together face to face, even in an online course, students may do that if they live near one another, or how you're going to meet um, virtually online. Will you use Collaborate or Skype or um, Google Hangouts or Facebook Messenger, or whatever this, the team would like to use, set those expectations for how they communicate with one another early. And then um, for your role, I think it's important for you to focus on that, as I said, that process of how they're working together and why they're working together. I know sometimes that collaborative learning or group work is attractive because then you have fewer things to grade. And I absolutely fall into that category. But at the same time, giving students a sense that they're working together for a reason, that there's value in that inherently. Uh, and it's not just your value at, at making it easier to grade that there's a reason why they have to do that, um, I think is very helpful at the beginning. And then helping them through that process as well. Uh, particularly checking in frequently, having touch points where students have to tell you how their team is doing or where they have to turn in a partial product. In my own course, when I have students uh, work in teams to complete an assignment, I actually I have them turn it in at five different times as they go through the process so that I can see it, I can give them some feedback, and they have the opportunity then to tell me if their team isn't working together well, plus I can see if the team isn't working well based on the product that they've turned in. So having those frequent checks throughout the semester helps to smooth out the whole process and make sure that the product and the process come together well. So again, just a reminder that you have that handout that you can work on for strategies to jot down a few things about social presence, what that means for your course, and what you might try to do in the future to pull that together. We're going to move on now to cognitive presence, though, and talk about what it means for students to be cognitively present in your course as opposed to just present. Because we would like for our students to engage in deep learning throughout the, the course and to really take away um, some significant gains because of their involvement in the course. So cognitive presence happens when students or learners share multiple perspectives. So they can come together to construct knowledge that's 
varied, that's multivariate, and has um, more connections to themselves and to each other. It does require some sustained communication among students to be able to do that, and between students and you. So it's, it's not something that can happen in isolation for any individual person, and it's not something that can happen between students without your input and your guidance and does encourage um, and require, honestly, some significant critical thinking and reflection. So some strategies for you to include. Again, we'll refer back to the model of critical thinking. We'll look at problem-based learning and reflective thinking as different strategies you can incorporate into your course. So problem-based learning is slightly different from traditional learning in that Generally, we tell students what they need to know. They go and memorize it, and then in some way illustrate that they know what they were supposed to know, and probably that they know how to use that. So for example, I was a math teacher before I started working in faculty development. And so in traditional learning, I would tell students a new theorem, a new a new way that they needed to solve quadratic equations. Let me tell you about quadratic equations and how to solve them. You guys go memorize the quadratic formula, and then I'll give you a test where you have to use that formula to solve some problems. It's, it's straightforward, and there are quite a bit, actually, of, of times where that's the most efficient way to teach our students. It's what we've done for millennia, and to pass on knowledge. In problem-based learning, though, you flip the story a little bit. You start with a problem. You start with a reason why you might need to learn more or know more or do more. From there, you and the students work together to figure out what they need to know to be able to solve that problem. And then they actually learn what they need to know and apply it to develop a proposed solution for the problem. So for example, uh, in, I'm going to use an example from a guest speaker we had once years ago. In a biology course, they were learning about, supposed to be learning about um, environments, uh, uh, um, bio environments, how the different animals and plants interact within a, a climate in order to support one another. And so the professor proposed the problem, which was a declining wolf population in, um, actually it was near, in a park near to their school, so it had a local connection as well. So the wolf population is declining, and that's a problem. So now we need to, as a class, figure out what might we recommend be done to solve that. So from there, they had to identify components of that problem, figure out what they needed to know more about. They needed to know more about what was killing the wolves. They needed to know more about wolf breeding and why there were fewer births and how the other components of the environment there were contributing to that. And therefore, as they researched that, as they learned it, they could come up with what triggers they might use to solve the problem in order to address the original issue. And along the way, learned everything that they needed to know about how animals and plants support one another within a, a bio environment to make sure that everything is in balance and healthy, an ecosystem. So instead of giving a lecture on it to begin with, they could identify that and learn it. Problem-based learning usually with um, deeper learning because students have gone out and researched they have thought about it and they had a stake in trying to solve this problem as opposed to the artificiality of the problems that we usually give students to demonstrate they know how to use a formula. Uh, Tracy is a great example of problem-based learning on how to handle traffic if Olympics came to Chicago. That's a great problem. And when the uh, Chicago had a bid in for the Olympics, it would have been a very relevant problem. Um, Again, problem-based learning is usually the sort of thing that, re that directs the way an entire course uh, is, is designed. It might be something you do in addition to the rest of the, the course assignments you normally use. It's a great final project to pull together all of the pieces plus extra that students need to learn. 
but it's something interesting to consider in how you design your course to make it more meaningful. Um, and then metacognitive and reflective thinking, I want to point out as a very easy to use uh, strategy in order to help students think more carefully about what they've learned so far. So for example, um, this is a Blackboard journal. It's a great way to have students reflect directly to you. They could also submit it as an assignment. They could do it publicly on the discussion board and reflect with one another, where they have to think about what they've learned, how they've learned it, how they're going to apply it, what, um, what else they maybe need to learn. They could also think about how they learned, what helped them learn or what hindered their learning, so that the next time they need to learn for your class or for another class, they can do so more effectively and more efficiently. So for example, here are some reflection questions. This is all in a handout again in your, um, in the repository called reflection questions. A lot of great prompts for questions you might ask students to reflect on either uh, through a private reflection journal or publicly. They're also great questions for introductions, these at the beginning of the course. They're great questions for minute papers if you have students in a face-to-face -face class in order to um, gauge their understanding. So things, you know, why did I take this course? What do I hope to gain? Uh, what are my academic strengths or weaknesses? How will I learn in this course? What types of support do I need? Um, those latter ones really help to inform you as well. In fact, all of them inform you quite well. Uh, I actually, as opposed to asking a specific question as a reflection, um, I start my course now with a discussion board. The very first one after introductions is for students to think about the topic of the course and how it relates to uh, either the job they are doing or would like to be doing, the type of work they want to be doing, um, my, I teach a course on evaluation methods most frequently, and uh, many students come into that course reluctant to take it and not sure how it will relate to what they, they're wanting to do when they finish their degree. So by having students answer that really early, I've actually I've gotten them thinking about why they're taking the course and its value, as well as how it's going to be meaningful to them in the future. So like, how will this course help me in the real world? During the course, you might ask slightly different questions, such as uh, after I've completed, a, a student completes a big project or a specific activity, what did I learn or why was I confused? What did I do well with this activity? What do I need to work on still? Um, how did I make sure I stayed on task? How did I make sure that I completed it? Um, all types of questions these, that are very process oriented, but at the same time, you can also ask a lot of questions like these, these early ones on more um, content knowledge and what they've learned and how they're putting pieces together. And then at the end of the course, you can ask other questions, more summative on what did they learn the most from the course? What, how, how do they feel they improved the most from the beginning to the end? What do they still think they need to work on? Um, what academic skills do they use to learn or do they need to continue to work on? Um, these can be used as a informal or formal, I suppose, evaluation of the course. You can determine from this how uh, your course design worked or, hope or potentially didn't work um, and how to improve it going forward, as well as gather a lot of information on what students are actually learning and taking away from the course. Uh, these types of questions, I think, are really useful to prompt reflection. Quite often, um, I've seen reflective activities where you, students are told, write a one-page reflection on the course. And students go, but what am I supposed to say in a reflection? I don't know how to do this or think critically about what I've learned, and I don't know what you're looking for. So providing a few other prompts, whether you want students to answer all of those questions or as examples of the types of questions they may ask themselves, can help to feed that reflective activity. So again, there's a section for cognitive presence on that handout. So whether you 
take some moment, time to do that now or at another time. It would be a great way to jot down notes for how you're going to have been or will in the future develop, help your students develop a cognitive presence in your course. So I want to remind you again of the community of inquiry model for the different components that all come together into hopefully a very strong and meaningful educational experience for all of your students in your online course or as I said also in your face-to-face -face course. This presentation is based on a lot of references because we wanted this to be as research-based as possible. The one I recommend the most for online learning is that last one. Here's the actual book um, that we have a copy of and have found to be really useful looking at effective online teaching and the research behind how to build a more effective and meaningful online course. My name again and contact information is here. I want to encourage you to reach out to me or to Tracy Miller, who is our excellent uh, text chat facilitator for uh, any additional support or questions you have around teaching online or how to make yourself and your students more connected and, um, and more community oriented in your online courses. But as I said, the, the important thing is to think about the ways that you are present, the ways you ask your students to be present to one another, and the way that you build in a strong sense of cognitive presence where students have to be fully and uh, completely engaged with your course.